Justin Taylor, can you also uh, come on for the moment? Sure. Hey. Hello, Kristen. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Photos at Zoom. Uh, my name is Natasha Egan, and I'm the Executive Director of the Museum of Contemporary Photography. Um, and I'm with here today with, um, well, virtually with Kristen Taylor, who can wave to everybody, um, uh, who is our uh, Curator of Academic Programming um, and, um, um, and the collections. And I'm also in the museum today with Stephanie Conaway, who will be helping out uh, as the studio visit, but she is uh, not in the vault quite yet. Uh, she will be joining us um, a little bit later. So just how today will work, um, I am going to do a short PowerPoint presentation uh, to talk about the collection. Um, and then I will turn that PowerPoint off and then um, everyone can um, explore the uh, vault with me. This is my first time back in the museum uh, since March 10th, uh, so it's really exciting for me to be back in the the center of it all, which is what I consider the heart and soul of the Museum of Contemporary Photography, uh, which is our collection um, of about over 16,000 photographs um, in here. Uh, but before I get started, I want to just make a couple of announcements about some of our upcoming programs um, that are virtual. Uh, tomorrow we're having a wonderful uh, cyanotype workshop uh, with Sheridan uh, Villa Real, uh, who's going to show you how to create a cyanotype, how to find objects uh, to work with the sun uh, to um, create cyanotypes. So I hope you can join us. Um, that's at four o'clock uh, central time tomorrow. Uh, and all of this information is on um, on mocp.org under events, um, and you can register for all of the webinars there. Uh, also on Friday, we're very excited uh, to have uh, Vera Luter. We're going to be, she's be joining us from her studio in New York City. Um, and we're very excited to go into her, her dark room and studio. Um, you're in for a real treat, so I hope you will join us um, as well on Friday at noon uh, central time. We also will continue photos at Zoom next week uh, with, two pro with two programs, uh, one on Wednesday uh, with um, a focus on Latin American street photography by our curatorial fellow uh, for diversity in the arts, uh, Delina uh, Perlamo Averdes. And we also will then be doing a studio visit with Puerto Rican artist um, uh, Christopher Gregory uh, Riera, who will be joining us um, from his studio in New York uh, with Delina um, leading us through that. So we're very excited for those programs. Um, but today we are going to be talking about uh, the museum's collection and I'm excited to now uh, jump uh, to sharing my screen with you, uh, which is a PowerPoint. Um, in the PowerPoint, we do have the opportunity to have the closed captioning. So you will see the text of uh, uh, of what I am uh, discussing um, on the, you know, what I'm discussing on the screen here. So photos at Zoom. Let's move to the next slide. So this is uh, a picture of the museum's West Gallery. It's the gallery that you walk into and uh, hopefully some of you on this call um, were able to experience our celebration of our 40th um, exhibition um, in 2016. But I love this um, picture because it really has the, our, our collection kind of um, exploding onto the walls here. It was a beautiful celebration uh, that went through, um, traced the, the, the themes of how we collect, um, uh, you know, over the years. So the museum, has been collecting work since uh, 1979, um, and we acquire work uh, in in different in in different ways. So the way this this exhibition worked was we went in kind of chronological uh, chronological order. This wall is some of the earliest photographs in the collection, made made earliest, uh, moving from the 1870s through the 1970s. Um, of a different collection of work. Um, and then on the back wall, we had more of the, also the 
the 80s was the decade uh, that we we pulled many of these works. You'll see some some works on the far right is um, John Baldessari throwing uh, three balls up into the air. It's uh, it's the series that goes uh, the whole um, height of the gallery walls. Um, you'll see uh, Tina Barney, Barbara Kruger, Barbara Caston. Uh, Carrie Mae Weems down low in the lower left corner, um, as well as Cindy Sherman above her, uh, the Starn twins um, above Cindy Sherman, and there's a bunch of the history of the history of um, photography or a history, a version of the history of, of the museum's history that kind of records many of our um, exhibitions and how we acquired work in those, in, in the, the years when we began collecting. And then we also had uh, multiple walls. This wall was what we considered our, some works from the 2000s. Uh, that we brought in here. We have uh, Zelie Maholi um, and uh, we have Brian Ulrich, Ed Bertinsky, Anne Millet, uh, Carrie Schneider. This is just to give you, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of um, some of the pictures that were, are, were taken out of the vault, uh, which we're going to see today, um, and put onto the walls in this celebration. Um, I wanted to move to uh, discussing an exhibition uh, that we commissioned the artist Jan Tiki to work with us in 2012. So I'm actually going back in time from that 40th show, but wanted to um, discuss this, uh, how, how we use our collection and how curators use the collection and how artists have interpreted the collection. Um, and what I really loved about um, working with Jan Tiki back in 2012, was he dove into a, an exhibition that tried to encompass the entire collection, uh, asking us questions about um, what, what is in there and how do you interpret an entire collection in um, a single exhibition when you have, at this time, we had about uh, 11,000 photographs um, in the collection in 2012. And so one of the things that he did is he approached it as, 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 our, as our database. And how do you look at works and start to compare works um, when you put them, put them together by database questions? And what I mean by that is one of, the, one of the ways to look at the collection is what is the largest piece in the exhibition I mean, in the collection, and what is the smallest um, piece in the collection? And he pairs these two together, um, which is in the database. But then there's also the physicality of bringing these two works, these two works together. Um, this is one of my favorite pairings of all times, and we have many, many pairings, and you can make many, many, many pairings, of course, out of 16,000 photographs. But this is one of my all-time favorite um, pairings. Uh, the artist that we're looking at is the, the, the largest piece in our, ex in our collection. Um, uh, Jan picked this because it was the largest in length. Uh, it not necessarily is the tallest piece. Uh, so he also made a curatorial choice to pick the longest piece. Uh, because he liked the conversation it had with the smallest piece in the collection. Um, but I just want to go back so you understand the size difference of physically of these two pieces, but then when you can look at uh, the objects themselves. So the long one is a Chinese artist uh, named uh, Shigu Rei, uh, and this is a large camera obscura. Uh, this was a, uh, a photograph he made of Shanghai um, in 2005. I should get my notes here so I can get this right. Um, and he, he, this was an important time in Shanghai when it was very much uh, growing as a city. I mean, the growth rate of uh, that city, um, I don't have my, the exact number, but you probably know that uh, the Shanghai was, and many of the cities in China uh, grew substantially um, in the 90s and early 2000s. So this, uh, this captures a, a, like a, a giant city uh, where he's 
building, he, he has a container, actually, he has a large piece of photographic paper in a container with a pinhole. Uh, and he's created what's called a camera obscura uh, to document all of Shanghai. What I love about this pair is it is paired with one of Walker Evans uh, photographs in our collection, which is actually smaller um, than the 35 millimeter negative that Walker Evans took this. So he must have zoomed it in the enlarger, he shrank it um, down. So it's, uh, the piece is only one, one inch by one inch, uh, the, the size of the, the actual photograph. And this is a, a city great in New York City. And so what I love about this pairing is that uh, Shigu Ray is showing us an a giant city and that Walker Evans is focusing in on a piece that he photographed in 1928 or 1929 um, of a very small detail of a, in, of, of a, of a city uh, great in New York. So this is one, this is my all time kind of favorite pairing uh, that Jan uh, discovered in his exploration of our collection. Uh, to this day, uh, Walker Evans, this is still the smallest piece in the collection, um, and Shigu Reyes continues to be the longest piece in the collection, although we do have some larger uh, pieces in height. Uh, Jan also was very interested in the, what we would call the luminosity of the collection. And one of the things he did was he took the digital scan of every single picture in the collection at the time, which was, as I said, about 11,000. And he put them all together in this seven minute video. And in this seven minute video, which I'm not gonna show you the whole seven minutes, I'm sorry if it's a little bit uh, nauseating uh, for some people to watch, uh, it's difficult. It goes very, very quickly through every single photograph in the entire collection. And the way he organized it was through the, lum the, the, the luminosity of the digital image, in a way, which means that he set it up from the darkest photograph in the collection to it slowly gets brighter and brighter and brighter, where the very last picture is the brightest or the lightest or the has the most uh, white in, in the photograph. Um, so the, it sort of encompasses the entire collection at that time. Um, and it gets lighter and lighter as it, as it goes. Um, so, and this is fun for me to do is if I, let me see, where's my arrow? My arrow is not. Okay, my arrow disappeared. But if you, if you um, stop the video, it's really wonderful to see uh, which image it, cap it, it, it freezes on. Uh, but this has moved to the next slide, which is a, many of the images all layered together, um, uh, a time lapse where I can see a Bruce Davidson uh, photograph in there. Uh, I can't recognize uh, many of the other pictures. Uh, that are layered in there at this time. But what this, what Jan Tiki did in the exhibition was that this video uh, physically lit up. So it started as a very dark room and then as the video got lighter, it physically lit the darkest picture in the collection with the lightest picture in the collection. Um, and so it was a really beautiful installation. Again, a way of making a a digital collection. I mean, how we're talking, you know, we're speaking right now in kind of the virtual, but I want you all to remember that it's very important. The physical object um, uh, is, it is very important uh, to us, of course, at this museum. Um, and so this was a remarkable way to, again, dive into the collection and, and study it and think about what these two pieces then paired together, being one, the darkest uh, you know, the darkest photograph in the collection um, with the lightest one. Um, again, I wanted to show you physically the objects, which is why I show this slide, uh, but just so they're difficult to see. Um, we have it paired with uh, 
Roy uh, DeGarava's untitled photograph of a black man in a window, uh, photographed in New York uh, in 1978, paired with um, Harry Callahan's uh, photograph of his wife, Eleanor, in 1947. Some of you may wonder that, how is that a picture of his wife, um, Eleanor? And if we weren't virtual, I would ask you all to um, guess what this is. Uh, uh, but I will, I will reveal that it is uh, her, her behind, her legs and her, and her behind. So it's a very um, beautiful uh, picture of form. Uh, and Harry Callahan uh, was an artist who was very interested in, in uh, form. Uh, he taught at the uh, Institute of Design, the Bauhaus, um, here, at, uh, here in Chicago. So I'm now off-roading from what Jan, Jan Tiki did with his exhibition because the collection has changed since 2012 when we did that exhibition. But one thing will never change. And one thing will be the very first piece that we accessioned into the collection will always remain this very strange picture photographed by an artist named Larry Williams in 1973 of a man punching the face and his the title i should have put the title on the slide the title of this piece is called rural saturday night we know nothing about this photographer unfortunately uh, we need to do some research uh, Larry Williams, if you are on this call, um, or if anyone knows Larry Williams, the photographer who took this photograph, I encourage you to have him reach out to us so we can learn more about this piece. Uh, but it was acquired. It's, if you look at the notes, it says museum purchase, comma, 1979, colon, number one. Uh, so this is how we, each year when we accession a piece, it gets the year that it's coming into the collection, um, and then it gets numbered with the order that it is coming into the collection. So forever, this will be our first one, and it's a very, again, very strange picture. Um, and I have it paired with one of our most recently accessioned pieces uh, from, uh, you know, from last year, uh, which is a photograph uh, that I can actually show them. It's, it's right here in the vault um, by uh, Maya Tami uh, from Finland. Um, and this is a, a part of a series of four pictures where she photographed four portraits where one of them um, is a human and the other ones are um, robotic. Uh, human figures. Um, and this, this, we acquired this work as part of uh, the exhibition in real life uh, that was just showing here at the museum uh, it, for in January through, uh, through March before we closed. Um, so this was a, a recent work that we acquired uh, for that exhibition and for the collection, but I really loved these two strange pieces, how they pair together these two different kinds of portraits um, and this pairing uh, will always change. Um, just yesterday, we had our first virtual um, board meeting where we acquired a new series of works uh, to join the collection. Um, and when those become accessioned, uh, they will be a new pair uh, to, to look at. Another one of my most favorite pairings uh, Again, very different from when Jan paired this work because we've acquired uh, new works uh, over, over, the, over those years, but the strategy is similar. That this is the, the oldest photograph made in the collection, uh, which is a battlefield of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it is from the photos from Nature, uh, July 22nd. Um, 1864 by George Bernard. Um, and it's paired with a, the most uh, recently made, or one among the most recently made uh, photographs uh, by Peter Cochran, which is a, uh, a photograph 
titled For Michael, uh, done in 2019. Uh, Peter Cochran uh, was uh, a, a recipient of our Snyder Prize. Uh, so he's a recent uh, uh, MFA graduate, uh, graduate uh, where we award uh, Snyder uh, Purchase Awards uh, to three artists uh, graduating from graduate school, uh, thanks to Maxine and Larry Snyder's endowment uh, called the Snyder Prize. Um, so this is a, this is a, a piece that we've acquired and it's uh there's a he he photographs um in nature there's a tapestry um of of a of a of a drawing of, of some body forms um and then he's photographing this directly in 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 nature so this plant is actually that's growing through the tapestry is out in nature um, we have a pair, a pairing picture that I, I should have included in here, which actually shows uh, his his setup um, that he has um, how to how he's created this this photograph in the environment. But these these two uh, pictures pair uh, really beautifully together uh, for me, being kind of the one of the oldest pieces uh, that we have in the collection and one of the, the newest. Um, and the oldest one uh, was uh, given to us as a, as a donation um, and we purchased uh, this newest one. So we acquire works through, through donation and, uh, and the museum actively purchases work um, uh, when we can. I wanted to move to an exhibition that we did uh, in 2017 called Recollection, Recollection. Uh, and this was uh, a way to look at the collection and again, almost uh, create narratives or themes from one picture to the next. In any time you're creating an exhibition, it's very important um, that there's a uh, dialogue and conversation between uh, between one picture and and the next as you move through the space so this this one was a way to look through the collection with many different themes i'm not going to go into too much that the, the show was quite large i'm just going to show a few of the pairings and the way that we conceptually thought of making some of these uh, connections so for example, um, I wanna focus on the back wall. You'll see on the far left, an, kind of an orange piece and the back wall has a long strip. And then there's two small uh, framed back pieces in the far back. So those are the pieces I'm gonna start by focusing on. Um, oh, this is another slide of that and another slide of that. But those three pieces that I wanted to focus on um, are uh, the, the first one, which is on the top, uh, which I will also show when we look at our, uh, in, into the vault, um, is Penelope Umbreco's uh, sun picture. Um, it, this is, it's titled 7,626,056,000 suns from Flickr um, on the, September 10th, uh, 2010. So on this date, uh, Penelope, uh, there were 700, 7 million plus pictures uploaded to Flickr on that day um, of people who had taken pictures of the sun. So she was really interested in um, how, how our, what our fascination is as as humans with the sun um, and that so many people would upload this picture of the sun. So she took all of the pictures This is a partial, you know, a small portion um, of obviously those 7 million. It's to, it's to represent those 7 million pictures um, about the sun and the interest in the sun. Um, this, this contends with one of our larger pieces. Um, it's not quite as long as Shi, Shi Rei's who of the camera obscure in Shanghai, but it competes up there. Um, it is, uh, I can't now, no, can't remember what the, oh, it's four feet by eight feet long. Um, and then the scroll um, that is on the back wall, uh, we went from this idea of the sun to um, showing, uh, to showing um, 
Kaito's uh, uh, long scroll. Uh, it is titled Sun, Glaze Sun Glazing Scroll, made in 2015. Um, Kaito was also um, a, a, a winner of the Snyder Prize. Uh, this piece was, uh, was purchased through the generosity of the um, Maxine and Larry Snyder Prize. So uh, you can tell that, that that's an important prize for us to collect emerging artists. Um, Kaito's piece, we wanted to relate it to um, Penelope's piece because it's, it becomes much about the sun. Um, this, this, this long scroll uh, that is um, actually 180 feet, so I think this wins the award for maybe the largest piece in the collection. Um, it's by, it's 12, 12 inches by 180, I mean 12, yeah, 12 inches by 180 feet. And what he did is he made a, uh, it, it's, it, he's from Japan and his, uh, his grandfather uh, was, it was affected by World War II and the bombings. And this is a piece that is a tribute to this idea of creating an atomic bomb, of capturing the sun, using the sun um, to, um, I don't know, the power of the sun. Um, this piece was made where he he unrolls uh, an ex photograph a uh, photographic paper that is exposed to the sun, and as he unrolls it, he he takes a breath. It's very much about meditation, and he takes a breath and exposes the paper to the sun, and then rolls it, and then exposes another section to the sun and rolls it and exposes another section. Um, and he does that 108 times. Uh, 108 is a very uh, meaningful number um, in Buddhism. Um, it's, so it's about the meditation and the uh, doing of 108 breaths. Um, there's a, they, some people believe that there's 108 uh, points on the body, it's sen sensation kind of points where important uh, that you, um, like pressure points. I, I don't know what exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should know that better. Um, but so, the, so we wanted to connect the power of the sun to the his piece that was about the sun, but ultimately a memorial to um, World War II um, and and the bombings, um, and really then talk about war, which leads me into the next two pieces, uh, which are uh, photographs that are actually put onto leaves uh, by the Vietnamese artist Binh Dan. And his work is very much about war um, and the Vietnam War and, uh, and the killing fields in Cambodia. What he does here is he uses photosynthesis to place a negative, an archival image that he turns into a negative and he places it on uh, these leaves from Vietnam and leaves them in the sun uh, for sometimes weeks to a month. Um, and through photosynthesis, it makes a record of the picture in the leaves themselves, which are from, uh, from Vietnam. And these pictures are of soldiers, um, soldiers in, in the battlefield and a young uh, Viet Cong soldier um, in the small leaf there. So you could see that the way we worked with this to show these pieces is we started with the sun, we went to, and then, and it moved to uh, war as well. And so you can see how it's a very loose uh, connection to, um, to talk about a broad range of pro projects of, that are in our exhibition. So moving away from where those sun pieces were, we then went into, you moved into another room. Interestingly, these were not orange uh, in, in the color tone. These were all black and white images, uh, but it was very much about the sun then being about outer space. Um, and these are three uh, th different pieces that are in our collection. The, the first one is a picture, um, of Earth, uh, from uh, let me just get my notes. It's for, it's a it's we have a collection of work that were printed. They're they're, they're NASA images that were printed by Ellen Cohen um, in our in our collection. And this is a photograph. Uh, it's a photo mosaic of Earth. Um, 
taken in, in, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one, taken in 1973. And it's paired, it's in the middle is a fascinating piece. It's one of my favorite. It's a very small piece in, in the collection by the artist Aspen Mays. And she was on a, she did, she's very interested in science and photography. And one of the projects she did was she was on a Fulbright fellowship at the European Southern Observatory in Chile in 2010. And when she was doing her research at the observatory, she came across this closet full of old pictures of the stars. Um, this is about an eight, this is like an eight by 10 a uh, picture that was in a in a filing cabinet um, of the stars and she just took a lot of the pictures and simply took a hole punch and punched out all the stars so you'll see there's large density of where there are no there, the the stars were in a dense place in the center um, but she just takes out you know it's playful you know this playfulness of taking out all the pictures on the all the stars out of that picture and then it's paired with um, a Czech duo team, uh, Jasansky Polak, who are two uh, collaborators uh, who have been collaborating since the 90s. And this is a very abstract piece. Um, it's, a, it's, it's quite a large piece. It's about 30 by 40 inches. And if you look closely at it, um, it's actually a potato. Uh, but it's made to almost look like outer space in some ways. So, so the curators of this exhibition, uh, which were uh, a group of us at the museum, as well as our graduate uh, students, uh, had, a, had a great time putting the show together to make these connections of space and the sun um, and both playful um, and very serious um, works. Uh, as you moved upstairs, uh, we had another section that was about uh, uh, power. Um, and so we, we combined these, there were many more pictures, but the, these are just three that I wanted to show uh, that take you again through this relationship that can also be um, pictures of power, but also formal compositions. I mean, so we'll start at the top is Paul Shambroom, where he went around um, and photographed in, uh, in 1999. He spent uh, the year photographing small town council meetings. I mean, I'm very, very small town council meetings uh, throughout the United States and photographed the, you know, the council members leading, leading the meetings. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful collection of work called uh, Meetings, I think. And, and the postures, well, I find the postures so fascinating um, of how they are showing kind of their power um, in this, you know, in this, in this council meeting. Uh, then we have uh, Dawood Bay's photograph of uh, Barack Obama. If we were if we were together in person, I would have you guess, for those of you who don't know the date, I would have you guess the date of this picture. Um, but I'm going to tell it to you, but I think my, many people will probably guess that it is around 2008 because um, Obama does not have gray hair at this moment. Uh, but this was a photograph that I would be uh, uh, took in 2006. Uh, he was commissioned by the museum uh, to photograph Barack for, actually Barack was our uh, honorary uh, chair for our benefit that year in 2006. Um, so this was uh, photographed for, for our benefit um, and then um, in, in 2006 and then obviously it became a historical picture. Um, I'm not sure if Dawood Bay is watching um, this Zoom at the moment, um, but if he were, I'm not sure if he knows that when, the, when his work was uh, represented um, at the Whitney Biennial, Dawood Bay's work, this photograph was the lead picture. Um, and I was intrigued that the, uh, the wall label was written um, that the picture was taken in 2008, uh, wrongly. 
Um, so I wanted to talk to the Whitney at that time and say, actually that picture was taken in 2006, but I know that the 2008 has a very different, very different ring to it, but, um, but it is from 2006. And then it's paired with, which I love, I love the uh, Loretta Lux. Uh, she's a German photographer. And this is a piece uh, of a boy named uh, Hopper. And I love how Hopper is in a very similar stance to the men in Paul Shambroom's picture and what he's learning and what he's becoming of, uh, about power. Uh, Loretta Lux uh, digitally, digitally manipulates her work. So Hopper doesn't look exactly like this. His eyes might be a little stretched, a little bit different, his ears. She, she tweaks the child's uh, figure in, a, in very subtle, strange ways to where they almost become slightly animated. Um, but I really loved these three, um, uh, these three pictures together, uh, speaking about power and, and um, and just the form of those. Uh, most recently, uh, we, 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 commis we, we brought Teju Cole, uh, the writer and photographer, to organize an exhibition uh, in 2019. Uh, here's a picture of him in our print study room, uh, pulling out works, uh, putting them together, seeing how he, he wants to create the narrative. Um, he, he came several, several times and he looked through the entire collection online um, and made lots of pairings and then visited the museum, I think three times, three intensive times uh, to then put these pairings together. Uh, the results of his exhibition uh, were, uh, it was a really beautiful exhibition. I hope many of you had a chance to see it. Uh, uh, we also have a really beautiful publication uh, where the, the exhibition started off uh, with very quiet pictures of open roads um, and then it moved into photographs of people, uh, singular people, people lying down, people um, kind of exhausted and tired um, uh, and then moves into people like crowds of people um, as he as he moved through, moved through it. I'm not going to take you through the whole show, but when it, it moved through to this very kind of intensity on the top, on the top floor, where you had just images of um, of destruction and of war and of chaos, um, kind of all together, crescendoing into this like the top floor. Um, of what humanity um, is going through um, and has always been going through. I mean, there were many historical works um, in, in this exhibition. There was that very early work of uh, George Bernard, which was of the battlefield. Um, one of the earliest made pictures uh, was also in this was in this series and then some very contemporary pictures of war in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, um, as well as just environmental um, degrade, uh, you know, pictures of the earth um, with issues of climate change. So it was just this, it, it captured um, a, a feeling of, of kind of chaos. But then the way our, the museum works is that you then turned around and went back down um, to a more the, the roads again. So it was a really a beautiful way to um, to experience um, a Teju's his experience of the collection um, and how he could use you know pieces from from the 1860s uh, to 2019. Um, in, in one whole form. It was, it was a really beautiful exhibition. And one of the last images I wanted to show, it's in the, if you look at the very back of the room, there was one image um, on the back wall, uh, painted on a black wall, framed in a black mat. Um, and it is uh, Roy DiCaravo's photograph. So you may recall that this was the darkest picture in the collection that was used in Jan Tiki's show. Um, this this picture comes back again um, with in in a in a different 
context uh, and serving kind of a different purpose uh, in Teju Cole's show. Um, for for Teju Cole, he considered this uh, the grace note. It was the moment where it was kind of the last picture you saw of the entire exhibition, um, and then you so you paused and then you turned around and then experienced as you as you left. Um, so this this um, I'm going to end here um, and. Uh, and now move to uh, showing you the vault, uh, but I'd like to open it up uh, to some questions that Kristen uh, is going to um, filter if there are any, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift to um, walking through the vault now. So let me just make this shift. And if Kristen, has now, Kristen is on. I just wanted to say if anyone has questions, please post them in the Q&A section. So far, all of the questions I have been able to answer for you, they've been about the collection. But um, if some come up, I'll jump in and ask, but I think you can go ahead and go into your vault tour. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna start with introducing Stephanie. Hello. Stephanie Conaway, thank you for being here. Um, so uh, we are currently standing in uh, our vault uh, that was constructed in 1997. It's a fully temperature controlled uh, vault. And when we built this in 1997, we thought it was amazing because it was such a large increase from our previous vault, um, and now we've completely outgrown it so quickly, <laughs> um, mostly because work started to get quite big. But I just would like to uh, start walking you through. So I wanted to start with, here is a small uh, photograph. This is Penelope Umbreco's piece. It, this is not the full size one that I, that we sh that I showed you in the exhibition. This is a smaller version. Um, Penelope was really wonderful uh, to understand that the core part of the of our collection is to use it for educational purposes. We pull works out for our for print viewings, and so this was because it was very difficult to pull a very large piece. Uh, she made a smaller version for us to use for educational purposes. But when we exhibit the work, we bring out the large one, uh, which is uh, stored off site. Um, you'll see that we have on the on this table here, we have some works from I showed you um, uh, Maya Tammy's uh, photograph. I showed you this one. Whoops, I just walked into the wall. Um, I showed you this one in the PowerPoint, uh, but it's one of a series of four pictures uh, that we just took off the walls because uh, they were in the exhibition. And you were to figure out which one of them is the human of these four <laughs> pictures. A little harder to see, not on the wall. And they're lying down flat because we quickly had to take them off the wall when we took this show down. And that's the, that's the fourth one. So we own all four of those pictures uh, for the collection. Um, and this is actually the human, uh, maybe you could tell. Um, and he's actually the scientist who also um, makes these robots. So he, uh, so this is a, that's a, that's a great, that's a great piece. Um, here is uh, Zanelli Maholis. You saw that in the very first slide as part of our uh, 40th exhibition. Uh, we have a wonderful, uh, this is one of Aaron Siskin's divers, uh, which we can show. Sorry, I'm not going into total detail of every artist here. But this one I have to go into some detail about because this is a wonderful piece by an artist named Anne Hamilton, 
also known uh, for a lot of her performance art. Um, let me see if I go horizontal, yeah, with my camera. Um, this is a picture where she has put a piece of film into her mouth and then opened her mouth very carefully or very, very small, creating a small aperture of light. So she's essentially made a camera obscura with her mouth and she's photographing her hand writing something at her desk. So I'm, I know it's probably a little hard to see, but if you get in, if I can get in close, you can see the kind of the ridges of her lips and her hands. And that's, so that is a camera obscura, of just the film in her mouth, using her mouth as her camera. That's Ann Hamilton. This is a wonderful piece uh, by uh, Nick Nakosha. Rambunctious kids. Um, this this is Bin Dan's uh, Viet Cong soldier that I showed in the PowerPoint, um, and this is Bin Dan's uh, leaf that is fading, has faded quite a bit actually, um, since we've acquired it. Uh, that's part of the nature. Um, this is Dawood Bay's uh, photograph of uh, Barack Obama. And then as we move through the space, this is uh, a camera obscure, camera obscure of, of Vera Luter. Um, I will encourage each of you uh, to join us on Friday uh, for our Behind the Lens. We will be uh, meeting with Vera Luter in her New York studio, and she will be taking us into her dark room and, and through her studio. And it's going to be a wonderful um, way to spend your uh, lunchtime. <laughs> hour on Friday. Um, so this is also a camera, a camera obscura, similar to Anne Hamilton's, um, although uh, she does not do it one from her mouth. She uh, creates, uh, this is from an office building, uh, from a room that she creates the camera out of a room. So we commissioned Vera Luter in 2001 uh, to come to Chicago um, and uh, photograph Chicago through cam her large camera obscuras. Uh, so this was, um, this is a one of a kind piece. Uh, each of her camera obscuras are because she just has the photographic paper in the room um, and then creates a, a small lens. Um, and this is one of my most favorite pieces in the collection. Uh, one, because I was, I have was here when we, we, we commissioned her and helped her on this project. Um, and that was exciting for, for us and for our uh, Columbia College students to help her develop these large photographs um, uh, because we had to do it in these big tubes. We rolled, we rolled them and that was an exciting thing. Anyway, so this is a really beautiful uh, quintessential picture of Chicago. Um, taken by Vera. Um, and then here it's a little, gets a little crammed, but here we have more of Dawood Bay's work. The reflection is probably not great, but this is a project uh, that Dawood Bay did in uh, Birmingham in 2012, um, kind of honoring after the 50 years of the the church bombing in 63. These are portraits that he did um, in Birmingham 50 years after and I'm trying to navigate this space. Um, this is a wonderful piece. I forget her name. Um, this is a very small photograph. Uh, it's not actually a photograph. It looks like a photograph. It looks like a zoo. 
Xerox copy um, of, of, a, of a textbook with photographs of the moon, but it's actually a charcoal drawing. It's a pencil drawing. Um, we have quite a few works in the collection that, oh, here's another part of it. Um, we have quite a few works in the collection that aren't uh, traditional photographs. Uh, we have sculptures, we have video, uh, we have this spooky mask. <laughs> that was from the, from the last um, exhibition. Okay, so I'm going to move now through, uh, or should I go over that way? Maybe I'll come this way. So I'm going to move through our space. So what you can see here is we have these movable screens. Uh, that they're called compression screens. So I was just inside this middle one here, uh, but you'll see we have many, you know, different screens, different ways to hang work. But most of the work is not hanging on screens. Um, it is kind of in, in shelves. Um, Here's a David Mizell. A large Christina Seely, uh, photographed in Madrid. Christina Seely did a project where she uh, photographed um, the brightest cities um, around the world um, in 2000 and nine, I think, she did that project. And this is David Mizell, I'm too close here. Um, David Mizell's a photograph of, a, it's a negative aerial picture of Los Angeles. Um, and then I will back up for this stuff. But as you'll see, we have lots of photographs are in these, what we call these slots that, uh, so you can fit many, many more photographs uh, in these slots than you can hanging on screens. I think I mentioned that we have 16,000 pictures. There's Stephanie, oh, Stephanie. <laughs> moving around, socially distanced. Um, so I wanted to just show some more on the screens here. Uh, this. This is a photograph uh, by, by Vic Muniz. Um, it's a project he did, I think in 2000, maybe 2001. Um, I have my notes, but they're not walking with me. Um, and he was commissioned by the Whitney Museum of Art to do a project. And so one of the things he did was he, he reimagined, um, installation photographs um, from a 1973 minimalism exhibition um, and using dust from the um, using dust from the museum uh, he then draws these uh, these minimalism shapes uh, or the minimalism sculptures or the photographs of them uh, this this, uh, this is a Robert Morris uh, sculpture and from 19, 1973. But, but what he does is he, 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 he ended up using the dust. I mean, he says, he has a very funny quote that he uses the dust from all over the museum. So the darker, oily dirt, it's from the boiler room down in the basement. And then he says, when you get to the top floor of the Whitney Museum, nobody knows what they're looking at, so they scratch their heads, so it's all dandruff, light, d dusty dandruff. So that's his quote, it's kind of gross. <laughs> um, but so he creates these, you know, using the dust as his palette um, to, to make this work. It's, it's, it's quite clever. And what, what's clever about it is he also then blows the picture up to the size of the original sculpture. 
Um, and what I also love about this work is there's two things that minimalist sculpt sculptors and photographers have in common, and that is that they hate dust. Photographers, for a long time, dust was a huge, huge problem uh, for photography. With digital, obviously, we don't worry about dust like we did um, in the past. Um, but so that's, that's very funny. And with minimalist sculpture, they like that also very clean. You don't want dust on a minimalist sculpture. Here is our, uh, I don't know if you can really see it. Uh, this is our Roy de Garva, the of the man in the black window, uh, man in the window. Um, and can you, can you kind of see it? It's, it's kind of hard to see, but I've showed it twice in the PowerPoint, so. <laughs> um, a few more of Aaron Siskin's divers up there. Uh, we have the whole, I think there's some more hiding down here. Um, some sculptures. This is William Christianberry's uh, uh, cabin. I don't know what it's called. I don't know the name of it. Christian, Christian Rose. Um, and more sculpture. Um, and here we have lots of boxes of, of photographs. You'll see we have uh, works, we have lots of boxes from the FSA. Uh, Dorothea Lang, we have a wonderful collection of Dorothea Lang's works here, over 500 of her, of her work prints. Walker Evans. It goes on and on. Anyways, I'm, I'm very quickly going to just go into our color. We store uh, uh, color photography, chromogenic development, uh, in a, a colder meat locker. And I understand it is almost one o'clock, so uh, thank you all. Um, I know some people have to leave. I will not, I will still take questions, but I will move just wanted to show you this color color vault where I'm in the meat locker. <laughs> and now I'm going to move back through the space here and Turn my camera around and ask if there are any um, any questions. There are a few that we've gotten so far. Um, Jim Ferguson wants to know how relevant the concept of something being archival is to acquiring it for the collection, and how much preservation work do you have to do with the collection? Well, that's a good question. That might be Kristen might be able to answer that even better than me. Um, so, uh, um, Kristen, do you want to answer that? I mean, that's what you did forever. <laughs> sure. I think he's maybe bringing that up because of the Ben Don piece where you talked about it fading. Yep. With work, it's made to fade. It's printed on a leaf and it's about the memory of war and how memory fades over time or the, I guess, the veracity of war fades over time in your memory. Um, but typically we do take it into consideration um, quite seriously. So sometimes we've been off this that, especially with color that hasn't been stored in those cooler temperatures has, has greatly shifted and you can't see the image as the artist would have intended it. We have turned down some of those types of gifts. Um, also, if work is going to put other works at risk, like if it had mold growth on it or something like that, where it's been stored in conditions that would actually threaten other pieces, then we would not accept that type of donation either. Um, but yeah, so we think about it case by case and being a contemporary museum, most things are fairly new and it's not too much of a concern for us. But we have received some works that do need conservation. Um, some things, uh, some things have experienced, you know, we might get something with some mold on it if it's an old picture from the 1860s and that's something that we 
we do um, address right away um, uh, with before it ever would come into the vault. Uh, it goes through a whole like to our whole process so that we're not bringing mold into the or or a bug you know bugs you know things live on photographs that have been in people's homes so we are very aware of that but there is artwork like in christian uh not christian um william christianberry's um uh, cabin that i showed you there is uh, uh dirt from uh his kind of hometown as part of it. And so we, do, we have other materials here and we do have works um, that, do, that do fade. Um, I've actually, all of our works, <laughs> you know, the color works, um, you know, are, are fading, you know, are fading a bit. We're trying to slow that down obviously by putting them into the cold vault, but it's uh, a lot of the materials um, are, as archival as can you know, as as they as they are when they were made. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that we do have um, Dawood Bay joining us, and also oh. Teju joining. Oh, Teju, hello! <laughs> I'm happy to have you both. I'm happy to have you both with us, um, and uh, and the the work that both of you have done for this museum um, is, has been remarkable. Teju, your, your exhibition, uh, Dawood, your exhibitions in the past, um, as well as then, of course, your work. Um, but but Dawood Bay has also curated uh, a portraiture exhibition uh, from our collection, um, which I should have shown, but this was, that was a while ago, and I don't have it all digitally at my hands the way I have more current shows. So I'm glad you could join us both. Well, Dawood has a question. He says, given that work is getting increasingly larger in scale, is more and more of the MOCP's collection being held off site? Yeah, so we do have, uh, we do have a storage area off site. Um, and one of the things that we think, uh, uh, we think about um, with everything that we, when, we're, when we bring it into the collection is, how are we going to use this for exhibition and how are we going to use it for education purposes? And there are some works like I like the Shigu Ray, the really giant camera obscura or Penelope Umbreco's uh, eight foot version. Um, if we can't bring them out for a print viewing um, or for to, to show in the in like to have on a screen, um, here in, in the vault, we do have large pieces um, off-site uh, for safety reasons as well. Um, and also there are some, we have some bodies of work that where we have, you know, 30, 30 by 40 sized images of that project. And we might keep two of them here so that we can show those as reference and then store the rest of them off-site. Um, I'm thinking about like Amile, we have a great, beautiful uh, collection of Amile's work. It's quite large. It also travels um, all the time. We, we loan work from our collection all the time. And that's an example of work where we have um, only two on-site um, and the rest are well, they're usually traveling <laughs> somehow, uh, but that's a, that's a great question. Yes, we are more and more having to uh, have works offsite, but we try to make the most accessible work. All of the Dorothea Lang, all of the small works, everything that can be out of a frame is all right here. And that's important to us to have uh, the bulk of the collection here, but really big stuff it doesn't make sense to have on Michigan Avenue. Tabitha Soren has a really great question. I'm just going to read it verbatim. Is there a list of individual photographs or bodies of work or artists that the museum is actively pursuing? And if so, what are the criteria? Are they relationship to the museum's collection, relationships to Chicago, or balancing out the collection to include more people of color or other underrepresented groups? What are the collection's gaps? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that is a, that's a great question. Uh, we don't have like a, a list that we share um, that says these are the people we're hoping to collect. Um, but we, in our collection, uh, in our strategy of, of collecting, we have a few, we have a few areas. Um, 
So one of the main things that we consider ourselves, um, uh, which is key to who we are, is that we do collect emerging artists. Um, that's that's our, kind of our place. We exhibit emerging artists, and when we exhibit emerging and diverse artists, we do our best to collect um, that work as well. Uh, so many of the works that Jan Tiki sh showed in his collection uh, and in his exhibition, uh, Teju Cole showed in his exhibition, all came, a lot, many of those works came to us through exhibiting emerging artists, even if it was back in the 80s and now they've since super, super emerged <laughs> um, from there. So we, we have a great effort in trying to collect what we show um, as best we can. That's an example of um, uh, Maya Tammy's work that I, that I showed you of the One of Them is Human series. Uh, that was for uh, an exhibition that we did on artificial intelligence. Um, that it was important to bring that work to the collection, not just to show it for that, you know, two month run of an exhibition, but to then have it for educational purposes and then to be used in another new context um, in the future. Um, we do have some holes, of course. Every collection has I shouldn't say some, every collection has tons of holes. <laughs> um, and we are, uh, we do have a, a list of like a wish list. Um, some of the wish list um, is beyond our ability uh, for financial reasons. Um, and so we do work on developing relationships uh, with, with people who, who maybe have acquired that work um, and ultimately will donate it to the collection um, or part of it uh, in, in, their in the future. So we've acquired some really amazing works um, through, through donations of, when, I, when I'm talking about a wish list, it's sort of like, we don't have the means, like we, we didn't buy them early. Uh, I mean, a great example of someone we bought early is like Alex Soph. We were like the first to show his work. We bought it before, like, before he took off to where we couldn't afford that work. So we have to be very aware of, um, you know, budget and what's coming in. Uh, but yes, we do have um, a list of people and then we are actively um, collecting work uh, from the exhibitions that we do and we hope that we are doing uh, diverse exhibitions. Um, so we will be acquiring, for example, uh, several works um, from uh, our next show that's opening called Tempura of, of, of artists uh, from, from Puerto Rico. Uh, we've only ha we had, uh, you know, a select group of artists uh, from Puerto Rico as an example in the collection, but we're about to make those holdings stronger uh, because of uh, the work that uh, Delina is working on now. So that's just a, it's a long answer for a, a something that we, we would like to tackle. Um, I would say, I'm proud to say, I mean, Kristen's going to know the answer to this better than me, but we have at least 50% are women in our collection. <laughs> I forget the exact percentage, but I know it was much higher than most museums. Yeah. So our collection does have 50%, you know, women, and we are working on, on all those aspects. So thank you for the question. Um, Pablo Rajic asked, besides archiving, are copies made as well? Having lost pictures to flooding recently, I've become acutely aware of backing up any images. Uh, so, uh, no, we do not have a practice of uh, duplicating anybody's artwork. Uh, all of the artworks in the collection are, you know, unique additions or part of an addition uh, from those artists. Um, so we do not, uh, that would be, that, that's kind of up to the, the artist. So if something were to happen, we have had some events, uh, luckily not very often. Uh, we, we had a fire uh, in 1999. Um, and we did lose like four original objects uh, that were not able to ever be recovered again uh, because of the historic nature of them. But other, other objects, um, if the artist is still, uh, still with us, um, 
have have been great at giving us another, you know, working out to have another copy made um, so that their work can continue to be represented. But we, that happens very, not very often. Um, and we do not have the practice. It would be against our, um, you know, the trust that we build with artists to be having re reproductions out there. In okay. fact, many of our exhibitions, when we do produce an exhibition print uh, with by an by an artist because of uh, shipping reasons or or anyways, sometimes we don't show the original like editioned piece. We might show an exhibition copy, and then we have to destroy that work. Um, Colleen Mullins asked if there are works in the collection that mirror the 1918 flu plan, flu pandemic. And have you discussed what the curatorial reaction might be to the art being made in the current time of lockdown? Um, that's a good question. I do not know of any pictures in our collection that document uh, the 1918 um, epidemic. Uh, uh, so, so that's the first part. The second one is that we, uh, we meet uh, as a curatorial team. Uh, we meet, well, actually in lockdown, we've been meeting once a week, which is <laughs> amazing. But normally we meet once a month um, uh, to review uh, work and review portfolios that are coming in uh, through our portfolio um, application called PICTER. Um, and it's remarkable how quickly the portfolios um, of this work are coming in and how um, how, how some artist, uh, Eleanor Carucci is a great example of someone who's really making very powerful work, uh, that's continuing in her, you know, in her, uh, in her theme of photographing her family, of, of doing it through this time. So I, I think very, uh, I think this time will be, recorded um, in future acquisitions. Um, I don't know what those look like quite yet, um, but I, we are seeing some very powerful work come through um, that people are um, making right now uh, during this time. Um, Heather Olklaus has asked if there's any virtual reality type of photography in the collection. Well, I'll show you, does this count? Let me show you something. <laughs> oh, the lights are off. Um, let me turn the lights back on. This isn't in the collection yet. This is our print study room. Uh, but we did have this work which is a little bit about virtual reality because they are QR codes. Um, there are QR codes that when you put your, the screen on that, I'm not gonna do that because I don't want it to trigger a website. Um, uh, connected, so they're made of objects like uh, salt, uh, black salt, stones, buckeyes, beans <laughs> um, and these QR codes actually uh, when you put your phone up to them um, do trigger uh, surveillance cameras um, in the United States and in El Salvador where the artist is from so I don't know if that counts <laughs> but I don't know if that counts but we don't really have too much virtual reality in the collection but we do have uh, we do have a wonderful program, uh, Kristen. Maybe you could describe a little bit about uh, how uh, Josh in the Democracy Show is going to be using virtual reality in the exhibition. Yeah. So our exhibition for the fall is guest curated by seven different faculty members at Columbia College Chicago. And they're all interpreting the question, what does democracy look like? So leading up to the next presidential election, using our collection as a tool to tell their version of democracy. 
And Josh Fisher is a professor in the Interactive Arts and Media Department, and he will be pairing a few images. It'll be a minimal installation in the exhibition of physical prints from the collection, but he will have a program recording people's comments about the work and then sort of altering it and um, changing their text to sort of how maybe the internet works or your original source material gets kind of warped and then reinterpreted and sort of grows out of the original context. So we have yet to see how that actually looks like, but it's very interactive and it will involve viewer responses to the work and then sort of taking it into this kind of virtual platform that we're really excited to see how that will work. Um, we have some other, um, I think work like Tsao Fei, I'm thinking of her video, um, is takes place in a virtual space where she's performing in front of a Second Life video of herself in Second Life. I think that is maybe the closest piece I can think of about virtual reality, sort of. Um, but we just had that great exhibition that Tash did, Natasha did, called In Real Life, In Real Life, that was a lot about virtual reality and sort of the movement of photography into that realm. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, one by our good friend Karen Irvine, and <laughs> she asked, "Oh, hi, Karen." <laughs> you mentioned the Vera Luter as being one of your favorite pieces in the collection. What's another one? Oh, another favorite piece. Okay, well, the Anne Hamilton, I think you probably could tell I love that piece as well, <laughs> the one with the mouth. Um, another favorite piece, let's see. Um, geez, there's so many. There are so many. Um, kind of depends on the day. Uh, um, hmm. I was thinking about uh, one that used to hang where the Vera Luter was hanging for a long time is a German artist named Beate Guschow. Um, and it's a, it was a, uh, there, there were two, uh, we had two, two different ones of Beate Guschow's work um, where she combines, uh, makes these very kind of romantic landscapes, but all through, um, multiple multiple pictures um, as well as these very apocalyptic uh, uh, cityscapes as well um, those two the 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 combo of those two um, are are quite interesting to me but Karen don't ask me that question I have so many favorites <laughs> I think that that is all for our questions unless anyone else has some there's a lot of great comments coming up oh here's a new one um, Jenny Sampson is asking, are you thinking about or looking at the current pandemic as it relates to photographic work being made during this time, which actually I think you kind of answered already. So yeah. recording this and posting it to our Vimeo page, if anyone missed parts of this, they can see the full um, session on our Vimeo page tomorrow, we'll have it up. Um, but if anyone else has any questions, please post them now. There's a lot of great comments coming in the chat too, of just where people are from and their feedback. So it's really great to see everyone's thoughts throughout this. Well, it's been really great to, for me to be back in the museum. Uh, some of you who, who know me know that I have been at this museum uh, for over 20 years. Um, so it is, it's a part of me. And so it's been great to uh, be here today um, and bring the collection to you all and I look forward to seeing many of you uh, tomorrow for our, our cyanotype um, and also on Friday. Um, I will be uh, helping from afar, helping Vera Luter. <laughs> we just got one and, more time. Do you want to answer one more? Or should we wrap sure. up? I, no, I, I could go all day. I love this. <laughs> you know, this is something that you and I have talked about a lot. Um, do you ever do a session? So, so deaccession, for those of you who wonder what that means, um, when we bring works into the collection, um, uh, you, it's called accessioning. You accession the work, it becomes, you know, 1979 number one with the guy punching his face. Um, and to deaccession work um, is 
can be a little bit more complicated. Uh, there's uh, and we we don't often deaccession artwork. We really are trying to have our collection keep a record of who was collecting at that time. Um, even if sometimes we don't know anything about, like for example, we don't know anything about um, that Larry Williams photograph, but to, but to know that somebody brought that in and accessioned it to as number one, um, there is a historical reven, uh, you know, importance to that. So, um, but we have deaccessioned, sometimes we have, uh, and this is something obviously that's uh, key to photography, um, is sometimes we will have duplications of, of an artwork. Uh, Particularly historically, there were many, the editions were much larger. To today, editions seem to be smaller. Um, and so there's not as many out there, but we, we have received duplications as gifts of historical works. Um, and we have deaccessioned um, uh, duplications. And with those duplications, when you deaccession it, it means that we put it into an auction um, and we use the proceeds from the auction um, sales to fund uh, new acquisitions to the collection. So in my time, I told you I've been here for a long time. We've done that once <laughs> um, to give you an idea of how infrequently we do that. And I think if I recall, we sold, I don't know, 25 duplications in that in that one time that we deaccessioned our work in the time that I've been here. I think that is all the questions. I've got a I've got a few questions about the Walker Evans being printed posthumously and I actually don't know the details of who made those prints. I do know that it must have been cleared through the estate, but do you know anything about that? I don't know. I'm sorry. We'll have to look into that a little bit more. Um, great. No, it was it was really fun to go through the collection, and then I I forgot to mention that the the other Larry Williams, the very the, so the second piece accessioned is so bizarre. I really should show that too. It's a picture of a woman. Uh, what is it called? Um, problem with Oreos. <laughs> problem. Okay, it's problems with Oreos. Parentheses with spinach because she she's eating an Oreo with spinach in her teeth. And it's just like, who was thinking? I, I mean, we have to get down to who accessioned those. How could those be the first pieces accessioned? You know, like, who is that? Anyway, so um, I, that was, it's, it's very fun to go into the collection, which I know, you know, Yantiki and Teju Cole and uh, um, that would Bay have had that great experience. And then our seven curators coming up. To they, it's a wonderful, anybody can do that. Just go to our collection and you can explore the entire collection. It's all online. Well, great. Thank you, Tosh. I think that's everything. Okay, I thank you. I Have a great day, everybody.